Thanks for joining me this week for Spilling the Tea. My name is Devana, and I'm the founder of Witches Tea Flint. We're a pagan organization based in Flint, Michigan that hosts events like tea parties, tarot bingo, witch walks, fairs, and festivals in the Flint area. We also have a web store at witchesteaflint.com. And we're on Etsy at Witches Tea Flint. And then we have this podcast. Thanks for joining me this week. In our podcasts, we like to dive into the energy of tea, the history of tea, impressions on tea, which is where spilling the tea plays a huge part. This week, we're going to talk about chai. First and foremost, I'm just going to say it. Please, 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 please. Are there enough pleases in there? Please stop saying chai tea. Chai originates in India, and in Persian, chai means tea. In our, here's the thing. We're going to go into some weird linguistics combined with the not so pretty history of tea and just kind of jump all over the place. I have ADD. This is what happens. We'll end up reflecting on things we've talked about in earlier podcasts, partly because, again, my ADD brain, and partly because there's ground to cover for those of you who've not been following along from the beginning. So it's a lot of information to unpack. I'll make sure I take it easy on you. We know that tea originated in China. Emperor Shen Nung had a boiling pot of water. What was he about to do? Well, who knows? Bathing or washing up? Eh, maybe. Cooking dinner like rice or something? Eh, more than likely. Although you would think that an emperor had people to do that for him, right? So in the process of this water boiling, some leaves from the tea trees, we covered this on an earlier podcast, by the way, the ancient wild tea grew on trees as tall as the redwoods, maybe even taller at one point. Leaves from the wild tea tree floated into the pot, and the aroma had fascinated the emperor so much that he decided to take a drink once the water cooled down. There's a couple things I want to muse on here for just a moment. First of all, we know that dried tea leaves have a fascinating aroma. Their perfume in the air, it smells really good. I mean, it really, it does. But what about this was so great that the emperor, someone who was the most important person in all the vastness of China, was compelled to take a drink of this hot water. Again, tea does have a very beautiful aroma, depending on the kind of tea you're drinking. Some are like, eh, and some are, whoa. I can't imagine this being one of those whoa kind of moments. But, you know, who knows, right? I have yet to smell fresh tea leaves. I mean, it is on my bucket list to do that one of these days. Once we can expel this virus from the world and travel again. But but back then, which we're talking about maybe like around the year 600 or so, there was a lack of spices in this particular time in history and drinkable plants. So there's that. And what was the quality of food and drink back then that this smelled so good that an emperor decides to forego all sense and logic and say, hey, let's drink this. It could have had a much different ending. We've read in books and been to Renaissance festivals and seen movies where kings and queens and anyone of importance had royal taste testers to avoid poisonings like back in medieval days. So I'm really stuck on this emperor of China goes and drinks something that he had no knowledge about whether it would kill him or not. And of course, well, he doesn't die, thankfully, obviously, it's how we got tea. So how did tea get to India and Sri Lanka and some of the other places in the world? Well, we covered that in an earlier podcast too, which we'll end up revisiting periodically. In the pitch competition that I participated in, I talked about how wars have been fought on nearly every continent over tea. And that is true. Tea got to India and many other places because the British had a supply and demand issue. People were drinking tea faster than the British could supply it, maybe two pounds. Now, tea is usually measured in grams in every other part of the world. And one pound of tea is 453 grams. One serving of tea is roughly three and a half grams. And they were drinking two pounds of tea a month. I drink a lot of tea. I don't know if I could drink that much in that span of time. Because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about this, and one serving of tea, it's not one of those one and done kind of things. When you're drinking tea, you can use a teaspoonful, which is what those small spoons are for, a teaspoonful, and you can get a at least two or three pots out of that. I mean, it's not like 
it's, you know, drink it and it's all gone and all you got left is water. No, you can add more water to it and make more and keep drinking it. So people were going through two pounds a person, men, women, and children. That's a lot of tea. And of course, the British couldn't keep up with that. So they had to do some pretty horrible things to get tea in other places. Because what they had to trade, the Chinese didn't need. They didn't need cotton because they had silk. They didn't need some of the other things, but they did really like silver. But, you know, silver is expensive, which is how the opium wars started. I mean, the British have done some pretty horrible things to get tea. They were not above lying, cheating, stealing, growing drugs to pay for tea. True story. Google the opium wars. It's pretty horrible. And that brings us to how tea got to India, sort of. So there was a Scottish botanist who figured out how to grow tea in India because he figured out how to propagate the seeds and uproot and save the trees and help them stay alive during transport. But in some parts of India, where chai originated, tea, the plant Camellia sinensis, was already growing there for who knows how long. And here's where the story just gets weirder. True tea comes from Camellia sinensis, but most of the time people call just about anything tea. Bark, flowers, weird seed pods, you name it. And in the world we live in now, tea can be pretty cheap. I mean, Lipton figured out a way to crunch leaves down to nearly dust, dump them in these filter bags and call that good. I mean, in perspective, most of us aren't really happy to eat the crumbs in the bottom of the potato chip bag, but here we go. We're doing virtually the same thing with tea when it comes to buying supermarket stuff. Maybe that's also why some people don't think that they're tea people. However, I have news for you. There are more tea people in the world than there are coffee people. Statista says that tea is the second most popular beverage in the world next to water. So coffee people, you can suck it because coffee sucks. I mean, I really don't like coffee. I've been asked why, but there's something in me that refuses to drink bean water. It's just not my thing. I did make my first tea though when I was three. It was a very natural feeling. I had my kiddie pool with water and maple leaves and random flowers from my yard and the neighbor's yards and drinking it while my American Eskimo puppy splashed next to me. I did learn the rules of sanitation pretty quickly and keep the animals away from the tea now, rest assured. Okay, so India. They had been drinking chai for hundreds of years, but without the tea leaves. Turns out tea at that point was too expensive for working class people, but gathering spices or buying them like nutmeg and cinnamon and allspice and others and boiling them in water was not that difficult and actually fairly inexpensive. Totally different from where we are now, right? I mean, you can get some of these things from the dollar store or from ethnic grocers, but they really aren't that cheap. Now, the commoners in India were drinking chai and the sultans and the highbrow people were drinking chai, spices, and the camellia sinensis leaves. And they had been for a very long time. In comes the British who are trying to figure out how to get tea to grow. Fairly unsuccessfully, first couple trials didn't work out very well. And they walked by these chaiwalas. Now, chaiwalas are roadside tea vendors. And they noticed a familiar scent in the air. But it couldn't be couldn't possibly be. Well, turns out it was. They asked to be shown what it was, and it looked like tea leaves, but it was smaller and not as hardy as what they had seen in China. So another botanist who was a scientist and a microbiologist took the leaves back to London and studied the leaves under a microscope and saw that it had the same cellular composition as the larger Camellia sinensis leaves that they found in China. It did take a few years, though, to get the crops producing what they had in China. Like 1853 is when they first started seeing some sort of movement and growth and the growing of tea in other regions. So how did this tea originally get to India? Who knows? I mean, weird stuff grows in weird places. We're not a stranger to that, right? I mean, migratory patterns of animals and birds, so very possible. And the British colonizers didn't start their bad behavior until much later after tea was discovered in India. So chai consists of spices like cinnamon, cardamom, ginger, nutmeg, cloves, and black pepper. It's usually the normal recipe for chai. I've been trying for quite quite a few years to master making a really good chai. I was first introduced in 2002. One of my sorority sisters, Carrie, 
she made a chai latte for me with Oregon chai, the kind you buy at the box at the grocery store, and I fell in love with it. But I was also angry because it, it's not cheap. I mean, it really isn't, and you don't get a whole lot in there. I've been surrounded and gifted with tea most of my life, as I grew out of Barbies and never really got too much into makeup. My music taste was out there and obscure, but if I wanted music, I figured out how to get it myself. Getting tea was something that was new and interesting, so I was given it as gifts. I tried just about every celestial seasonings variety that they make. I had Lipton and Twinings and some of the other supermarket brands, but chai was new and I couldn't get enough. I tried making it myself, but there was always a challenge Getting the right variation of spices and the right mix became my mission. And it actually wasn't until May of this year that I finally got it right. We're talking like almost 14 years of working on a tea. And what I figured is if you want to make something right that's from another culture, whether it be food or whatever, your best bet is to go to the source, which is what I did. I have friends that own Bombay Grocers in Ann Arbor and went to them and said, okay, this is what I'm trying to do. I am trying to make a really good chai. And for some reason, no matter what I do, it comes out tasting really aggressive. I I mean, I think I did the wrong combination of black pepper. Couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong, but I was shown. And boy, did that make all the difference. Now, what I did add on my own, which is something you may not find in some other chais, is I like adding star anise. I like the star shape and the fragrance. I also add a little bit of coriander and a little bit of fennel, but it's ground down pretty small because a little goes a long way with those two. Now, all the spices in chai are money drawing. So if your finances have been a little sketchy and you want to boost those on a cellular level, chai is it. These spices are also good for bringing love into your life and being lucky. So maybe you aren't a fan of pumpkin spice during pumpkin spice season, or you just maybe need a little break from all things pumpkin spice. No judgment here. This is a really great alternative going to chai. And I know that black pepper seems odd, but pepper is also really good for warding off evil and for exorcisms. So little chai a day keeps the three spirits from a Christmas carol away. Unless spirit really needs to have an intervention with you and not much is going to keep them away. Chai has some amazing health benefits and it can be added to black or green tea depending on what region of India you visit. Some parts of India near Kashmir, you're going to see them use green tea. They'll also add in a little baking soda. I know it sounds really weird, but trust me on this one. And then they add some saffron threads. And it makes this amazing drink called a noon chai, which turns the water pink. And it is very creamy. And it's just, oh, the flavor of a noon chai. A really good noon chai is amazing. And of course, it's pink. So that makes it even better, right? Once I discovered that, it was all over for me. Now, most other parts of the world will use a black tea base, which can be anything from a hung cha from China or a good quality Darjeeling from Darjeeling, India. I like hung cha because I like merging the worlds. Hong cha literally translates to black tea or some call it China black. What I use is a tea house grade that boosts your oral and bone health. It has antiviral properties, antifungal properties, antibacterial. It boosts your heart health and repairs the damage to your heart. It also helps being an asthmatic. Sometimes you need things that can help open up those bronchioles and this is a really good natural way to do that. This tea also helps prevent some cancers by blocking them at the cellular level, balances your blood sugar, aids in digestion, and can help you lose weight. It also helps slow the aging process, makes you feel better, and black tea is a huge energy booster. But when combined with the chai, let's just say drinking chai at night is probably not a great idea, unless you want to be rearranging your entire house. I mean, and if we're getting ready for the holidays, it might be kind of something you want to do. Chai is also really great for helping with digestion too. It is great at relieving nausea, aches and pains, improves your health at a cellular level. It's really good stuff. Now, energetically, you're boosting those creative juices. You're feeling more passionate about life and, and the things you do. You're keeping the sketchy vibes away, expelling negativity from your body. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. And then you have another cup and realize it does get better than that. 
It also increases your productivity, which means you can and want to do more and you're able to get more done, which is just a win across the board. So we've come to the point where I'm out of tea and needing to end things for this week's podcast. I want to thank you for joining me. It's been wonderful diving into all of this with you. I really do like talking about tea. Now you can find my chai blend on the website, which is teaflint.com. It's called Chai Strung Witch. You can thank my friend Quentin for that inspiration. I hope you have a great evening wherever you are. Thank you again for spilling the tea with me. Leanne, the official astrologer for Witches Tea Flint, will be on tomorrow to talk about what the stars have in store for us as we start the holiday season. Stay safe, stay healthy, be good to one another, and we'll be back next week with another Spilling the Tea.